Thank you for joining us tonight. On screen, we are showing a pre-event slideshow. The live logo appears in gold on a white background alongside the text, live from NYPL presents Names of New York, Joshua Jelly Shapiro with Suketu Meta, April 21st, 2021, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. This slide contains an image of the featured book jacket. The cover shows a view of the waterfront of Lower Manhattan looking uptown with two bridges and neighboring boroughs visible in the background. The depiction of Manhattan dates to a time when the skyline was very different with a few tall buildings, but before the proliferation of skyscrapers. The text reads, Names of New York, discovering the city's past, present, and future through its place names. Joshua Jelly Shapiro. Names of New York is available for purchase online from the library shop, on.nypl.org slash shop live. Proceeds benefit the New York Public Library. Reserve a copy for free with a New York Public Library card. Visit tonight's event page to find this title in a variety of formats, nypl.org slash live. The last slide features recommended reading. Joshua Jelly Shapiro suggests these books for further reading. There are images of four books. This Land is Our Land, An Immigrant's Manifesto by Suketu Mehta. Low Life, Lures and Snares of Old New York, by Luke Sant. Nonstop Metropolis, a New York City Atlas, edited by Rebecca Solnit and Joshua Jelly Shapiro. The Iconography of Manhattan Island, 1498 to 1909, six volumes, by Isaac Newton Phelps Stokes. Check out the full list and reserve these titles by visiting tonight's event page, nypl.org slash live. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another Live from NYPL. Thank you for being with us and for taking the time out of your day to spend an hour hearing about a very cool new book, Names of New York. My name is Aiden Flax Clark. I work at the library and I have the special privilege of being part of the team that brings you these Live from NYPL events. So I am very excited that you're all with us here tonight. Uh, like I said, you're here to learn about a fascinating new book, Names of New York, though obviously you already knew that that was why you were here. Um, talking about it is the book's brilliant author, Joshua Jelly Shapiro, and he'll be speaking with uh, the author of one of my favorite books of all time, Maximum City, Suketu Mehta. Names of New York explores the past, present, and future of the city through its place names and the myriad languages, cultures, and people that gave those places their names and thus have helped shape those places. Um, it celebrates the successive waves of immigrants and settlers from around the entire planet that have come here over the decades to make New York the polyglot, multicultural smorgasbord that it is. So you won't be surprised to know that this talk is coming to you as part of the library's World Literature Festival, which began on April 12th and runs through April 30th. The festival celebrates books and writers from around the world and reflects the languages spoken in our communities. Some of what's on offer includes special author talks in multiple languages, multilingual story times, workshops, and interactive programs for families. Plus, on our website, you can find book recommendations, links to multilingual resources, and lists of what New Yorkers are reading in all of these different languages. Um, it's a really great festival. We're really proud to present it to you and hope you'll come check out more. So to learn everything that's happening, go to nypl.org and you'll find a link to the festival right on the homepage. Um, meanwhile, if you have an NYPL library card or you live in New York State and you'd like to apply for one now, you can borrow Names of New York along with Joshua and Suketu's other works uh, for free. And if you're able, of course, I'd also encourage you to buy Names of New York um, from the library shop. It's Joshua's new book, it's really fantastic, and proceeds go to benefit the New York Public Library. You can find the links to get the book in the chat now and it's also available below this video on the event page at nypl.org slash live. Also on that page, you can find some links to suggested reading from Joshua, as well as how to get it from us. So I encourage you to check that out while you're there too. Um, and hey, you know what, while you're on our website, why don't you see some of the other live from NYPL events that we have coming up in the weeks and months ahead. Um, just for instance, next week, uh, also as part of the World Literature Festival, we are going to present an evening of poets, artists, and activists celebrating a thousand years of Persian poetry by women with readings, conversations, and much more. It's going to be a great one, and there's a lot more past that. 
So go to nypl.org slash live to see what's happening and to register. Um, these programs are made possible thanks to the generosity of folks like you. So please consider supporting the library however you can. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Suketu and Joshua in just a second um, after I tell you these couple of quick housekeeping things. Um, first of all, the library values your privacy. So in the spirit of transparency, there are a few things that we want you to know. Um, even though the video and chat are on an nypl.org uh, page, they are hosted by YouTube. So by participating in the chat, you might share data about yourself, which the library does not control. Um, for more details about this, you can go to our FAQ page, along with Google's privacy policy and the library's pol privacy policy, all of which are on the event page. Um, if you have any questions tonight for Joshua, he will be delighted to answer as many as he can. You can send them at any time um, in the chat uh, that's on next to the video, uh, on the Google form that's on the event page, or you can email publicprograms at nypl.org. Um, like I said, he'll answer as many of, as he can at the end of the conversation. Okay, so let's bring them on. Let's welcome Suketu Mehta and Joshua Jelly Shapiro. All right, thank you, Josh. Wonderful to see you here, old friend. Wonderful uh, to see you. Thank you, Suketu. Uh, I just so enjoyed this book, and I'm going to uh, show the audience the cover. Um, it is, I never look at New York uh, the same way again. As I walk around now, I find my experience of the city enriched. You know, each, each name is a story, uh, and each story has a name. So maybe uh, I thought we could begin by well, I'd, I'd like you to read something from your book, but just to give people a sense of the stories that uh, are connected with the names in your book. Um, can you run us briefly through the five boroughs of this great city and how each of them got their names? Wow, I would love to do that. Um, I should begin also just by saying, apart from thank you to you, Suketu, it's a particular uh, honor and thrill to be here, one of my favorite New Yorkers and favorite writers really ever. Uh, so thank you for being here. Thank you to the library, um, this temple of books and of New York City. Um, it's great to be here talking about this book. Um, the boroughs of New York. Manhattan first, right, comes from the Lenape word, the Muncie Lenape word, Manahatta. Great bit of debate about what precisely that means. Uh, some say Island of Hills. Our better theory now is place where we gathered wood for bows and arrows, but we will talk about that later on. Uh, Staten Island takes its name from the Dutch Estates General, right? It's sort of a riff on the Dutch name for, uh, for the Estates General in Holland back in the day. Brooklyn is an anglicized riff on the Dutch Brooklyn uh, for broken land, it sort of names its, its marshy and broken uh, constitution uh, back once upon a time. Queens, of course, honors the monarch of uh, old Blighty of Britain. Uh, and the Bronx named for Jonas Bronck, uh, a Danish or perhaps a, a Scandinavian man uh, who had an estate in that part of what's now the city. Uh, the Bronx, I like to say, you know, it's the only part of New York that's actually connected to North America. So it has that, that claim to fame in the city of islands. Um, but anyway, there's our basic geography, and uh, I'd be thrilled to to read a little bit if that's how we should start. That'd be great. Yeah, um, uh, let's let's give uh, our attendees a flavor of of the wonderful writing in the book. Excellent. Yeah. No, I, this book. I mean, it. Um, you know, I'm a geographer who's also a writer, so I, I care deeply about place. I love place. I love language. So place names are, of course, where place and language come together. Um, and so. I'll just read a few pages from the introduction, which uh, speak to the power of names. And I'm especially glad to do so, uh, you know, this week, this week in American history when uh, protesters and relieved celebrants are, are sort of literally in the street uh, repeating this phrase, say their names, which I think speaks to the power of names to, to move history and to shape it. So the power of names, names matter. Just ask any parent agonizing over what to call a newborn or any kid burdened with a name they hate. 
Just think of the song made popular by Johnny Cash about a boy who explains that life ain't easy for a boy named Sue and confronts the father who named him. My name is Sue. How do you do? Now you're going to die. Whether you traverse your life as a Jane or an Ali or a Joaquin or an Eve, or you decide as a grown up that you'd rather endure or enjoy it as someone else, we all learn that names mark us. Totems of identity, systems of illusion. Names can signal where we're from, who our people are, who we attach ourselves to, which Bible character or dead relative or living movie star our namers loved best. Murmured by an intimate or yelled by a foe, a name can be an endearment or a curse. The claim by protesters in the street, a name becomes an assertion of dignity, of rights, and of the refusal to overlook or forget. Names are shorthand, they're synecdoche. They are acknowledgments or shapers of history, containers for memory or for hope. And if names matter so much when attached to people, they matter even more when attached to places as labels that last longer in our minds and on our maps than any single human life. Name, though it seem but a superficial and outward matter, yet it carrieth much impression and enchantment. That's how Francis Bacon described the matrix of associations we affix consciously or not to the public words by which we navigate our days. Place names can bind people together or keep them apart. They can encode history and signal mores. They can proclaim what a culture venerates at one moment in time and serve as vessels for how it evolves and shifts later on. Gettysburg, Attica, Stonewall, Rome, Wall Street, Main Street, Alabama, Prague, Malibu, Beirut, Boca Raton. Place names can summon worlds and evoke epochs in just a few syllables. They can recall long ago events or become, as settings for more recent ones, metonyms for historical change. Place names can become styles of dress, Bermuda shorts, capri pants, and of dance. Once we did the Charleston, now we do the Rockaway. They can hail rebellions or honor heroes or spring like Sleepy Hollow and Zion from books. Were their names born of whimsy or faith, whether it was first written down by Cavalier in his log or a bureaucrat in a city hall, its impression and enchantment derives too from the truth that its meaning can't be fully divorced from its roots. In place names lie stories. Stories in the first instance about their coiners. Tales say about the long ago Dutchman who wandered an island of wetlands and hills that the people who lived there may or may not have called Manhattan, but whose northern acreage those Dutchmen named from marshy town in Holland called Harlem. Then there are also stories about the complex or contradictory processes by which certain labels come to be recognized as official. Stories about how people, singly or in groups, attach certain attributes to place names that grow iconic. Iconic of, for example, as with 20th century Harlem, black culture and pride. And stories too about the ways that such words thus do much more than merely label location. About how these words and their rhythm and sound and how they look rendered into Roman letters or affixed on street signs and maps have the power not merely to locate experience, but to shape it. Not merely to label the locales to which they refer, but also in some mysterious and beautiful way to become part of them. Portals through which to access the past, place names are also a means to re-examine, especially in times of ire and tumult, what's possible. And nowhere is this more true than in a great city, a place, as the geographer Yifu Tuan wrote, that can be seen as a construction of words as much as stone. Cities are monuments to its civilization and creators of encounter. They're nothing if not generators of tales. And if language is consciousness and humans are a place-loving species, then place names, toponyms as they're called, may mold a larger piece of our minds than we think. That's really wonderful, thank you. You know, as you were reading that, I started thinking of a, an Indian man I once met. He um, was an engineer who lived in Frederick, Maryland, but worked in Jersey City. So twice a week, he would commute from Frederick, Maryland to Jersey City. And it was like a four hour drive up this incredibly boring highway, you know, Interstate 95. And so I asked him how he kept himself sane doing it for 
year after year for decades commuting. In fact, as he drove up along 95, he would look at the names on the exits and then transpose them in his mind with the names of towns and villages in his native Kerala, the uh, a state in the south of India. So for example, I don't know, Tarrytown might become Trichinopoly or Allentown might become Aleppo. And then with each name that he would transpose, he would remember a particular story attached with that place. So, oh, I once had a cup of coffee in Trichinopoly and yes, it was very good coffee or Allentown, that, that's actually Aleppo. And in Aleppo, I loved a girl once. And the, so he'd have this memory train as he was driving along this incredibly boring stretch of highway filled with trucks. And this is how he kept himself sane. So, you know, I have the same thing as I walk around New York. I've now lived in New York since 1977 and there are different parts of the city. I used to live in Jackson Heights. I now live on Bleecker Street in Manhattan. Uh, I've lived in Brooklyn. Um, and I, I, with each of these addresses, you know, President Street has a particular um, resonance for me. Bleecker Street does. Uh, 83rd Street has this particular, and if you mention these, just the names themselves to me, I'll have, I'll go off on my own memory trains, right? Uh, and towards the end of your book, you mentioned this wonderful detail of how each of us has a personal map of our city. Uh, in, and, and you talk about these workshops that you did, and someone um, came up with the term Exlandia, which is the, uh, yeah. yeah don't don't go where, right, exactly. Don't go where my excellence. Um, no, and what you're speaking to uh, there, right, is the way in which um, all of us live in a sense in our own city, which is to say that we all, whether we do so consciously or not, map it in our own ways. We have our, our sort of set of associations and memories and meanings that we attach to to street names, but even to, to intersections, you know, um, on the grid, numbers can, can attain a, a meaning in Manhattan. You know, John Paul Sartre said that in Manhattan, he was, uh, he was never lost, but he was always astray. He hated the, the grid. He thought it was so anonymous. But then I think that um, you just have to look to the sort of incredible store of, of, of records and songs and poems that are sort of devoted to particular intersections or streets crossing 110th Street or the Ramones, 53rd and 3rd, or, or 125th Street, right? Um, so all of these places and place names can, can gain incredible meaning both in individual lives and, uh, and to us as a collective. Um, and what you're speaking to there, that sort of idea of Exlandia, right, uh, came about, uh, I worked on this, this project that we were privileged to have you involved in as well, Nonstop Metropolis. Um, and it contained, you know, 26 maps, but of course there are innumerable more maps and sort of ways that you could chart the city. Um, and in this book, uh, one of the things I tried to do in Names of New York was to take that kind of immersion in these names, um, in the place names, and to try and dig into, yes, the story of their origins and also the story of how they have evolved over time, um, both in their sound and in their meaning, because many of them uh, you know, begin as a Dutch name and become an English one and then have a whole set of new associations based on uh, lived experience or cultural texts about them. Well, tell us about your own relationship with New York. You are um, from up north, from Vermont. Um, when, what was it like when you first came to New York and what are some of the most evocative place names for you, either because of the stories associated with the names or because something happened in, in your life that was associated with, with those names? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yes, no, true story. I grew up on the mean streets of Montpelier, Vermont, a uh, bucolic place. Uh, but I have, I have family roots in New York, as, as many Americans do, you know, roots that, that pass through Ellis Island. Um, and it's a place I'd always spent time as a kid and growing up, and I've spent a you know, large chunk of my adult life here. Uh, but I think, you know, it's fair to say that New York itself, the name of the city, was always a kind of beacon to me. And I could sort of name, you know, again, to, to mention songs, Linden Boulevard in, in Queens, a kind of random place, but because of Tribe Called Quest and the marvelous 
hip hop music they made in the 90s, you know, that became a place. Linden Boulevard represent, represent uh, Bleecker Street, you know, associations with Bob Dylan. There's, there's any number, but New York itself, you know, is, has obviously been a, a place name that's become iconic around the world, as has, by the way, Brooklyn, now one of the more popular names in America for baby girls, uh, which I blame entirely on um, on David and Victoria Beckham for naming one of their kids Brooklyn 20 years ago. But um, but there you have it. It becomes iconic of certain things. But no, New York itself uh, is, is iconic from hearing Frank Sinatra sing about it, New York, New York, or, or, or Nas talk about his New York state of mind, great, another great hip hop artist from some years ago. Uh, and for me, one of the pleasures of this book was to dig into the actual meaning of, of New York, right? Because the simple way to explain what New York means, right, is that when the British came, when Richard Nichols comes in 1664 to kick the Dutch out and, and claim this place for England, he names it after his patron, the Duke of York. Um, so that's the simple way to say uh, that's how it got its name. But York itself, of course, is a place name with all these layers. And in the old world, you have to dig back far, much further than you do here to kind of dig into these things. And um, as uh, my linguist friend, Ross Perlin at the Endangered Language Alliance uh, likes to enumerate this story, you know, York comes from Eoforwick initially, a Celtic word meaning place of the yew tree. It becomes Eboracum when the Romans are, are uh, in Britain, it comes Yorvik when, when the Vikings are there, and finally becomes York in Old English. So it's funny just to think about when you hear you know, Frank Sinatra sing New York, New York, or, or Nas rap about his NY state of mind. It's, uh, you know, they're sort of hymning the mental weather of, of the Duke's new place of the yew tree, which gives it a whole new, a whole new sense. But uh, no, that is to say that New York itself has always been iconic to me. And, and that's just but one example of the layers that, that you can find if you just sort of scratch at any, any word that sticks in this place. So how did people in the old days in Dutch and English times decide um, um, how to name a place? Like who got to put their names on a street and, and who gave them the sanction? Right. I mean, to chart the history of naming is, is of course, to chart a history of power. You know? So in this part of the world, in the so-called new world, is to chart stories of colonial conquest, of settlers who were are coming to claim territory or, or to buy it from the indigenous people as the case may be uh, here. Um, often though, it's, it's just, you know, some random cartographer, someone on a boat who's out in the harbor, you know, and sort of decides Heart Island, for example, it's like, oh, I think that looks like a heart. I'm gonna label it Heart Island on my map or, uh, or North Brother and South Brother Island. They look like, they look like siblings. So I'm gonna name it that. Um, Obviously, we mentioned Jonas Bronk at the top. You know, many names, of course, just come from uh, whoever that landowner was and sort of the place becomes synonymous with them. Um, but I love some of the stories I love best in, in New York, uh, the story of, uh, of names that were Dutch and become English, but become just kind of anglicized Dutch words, you know, because once the English show up, they change many names, but they seem to like many others. You know, we have all these kills, you know, kill van call, fish kill, peak skill. And people say, what, what the heck is that? And it's just the Dutch word for creek. And it seems that the English sort of liked those well enough and kept them. But there are many others, you know, Coney Island, for example, is, uh, you know, to the Dutch, it was Coney Island. It, it meant something, an island of rabbits. And the English seems that they liked the sound of that, left it Coney Island, which is kind of, doesn't mean anything in English, except now to us, it means you know, amusement parks and cotton candy in the summer and, and beaches and so on. Um, or one more I'll give you, you know, Gramercy. Uh, sounds like a kind of distinguished, uh, you know, English place name, perhaps brought over from across the sea. And of course, many place names are just people from a place wanting to sort of recreate that place here, like Harlem or, or, or whatever else. But Gramercy actually comes from a Dutch phrase, uh, the Kromar, the a, uh, a crooked marsh, right? And so it actually described that part of Manhattan, um, later on filled in and turned into a kind of Tony residential district that, that the English called Gramercy Park. But it's fascinating to me the ways in which um, sometimes it's just the sound that sort of sticks with people um, and that they perhaps turn into their own tongue or something that feels good for them to say. 
uh, and it becomes its own place. And the examples of that are countless across the city. Uh, and you're intimately familiar with many of them, especially the sort of um, the ways in which different waves of immigrants have taken place names and sort of turned, given them a new gloss or made them uh, made them their own. Well, actually, uh, one of my favorite stories in your book concerns me. Uh, and you, you do you, make a make a walk on appearance in the book. I'm very <laughs> I was very honored to see that. Uh, I grew up in Jackson Heights, but the South Asians. Uh, in that wonderful uh, area, we refer to it as J. Kissin Heights. So J. Kissin is short for J. Krishna. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the, when, when a Pakistani says to an Indian, ah, yeah, you're from J. Kissin Heights, both of us know what it is, um, even though the Pakistanis and Indians have different views about Krishna. Um, but, but one of my favorite stories uh, there is uh, about uh, the intersection of 35th Avenue and 81st Street, which is two blocks from where I grew up, which is home to a particular kind of church where a particular kind of game was first played. Please elaborate. Indeed. Well, you 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 will elaborate on the way I tell the story. But yes, that particular corner, uh, now celebrated, known as the Scrabble Corner, uh, because in the basement of the Methodist church there, uh, an architect called Alfred Mosher Butts during the depression, uh, worked with his friends to invent a game that he called crisscross words and eventually was marketed as Scrabble. Now millions of people around the world play and love this game. Um, and some years ago, right, uh, a, a sort of guerrilla urbanist, if you like, affixed some, some subscript numbers to the street sign there. Um, giving all the letters of Avenue, you know, their, their correct worth in a Scrabble board. Um, and it became a kind of beloved neighborhood landmark, just celebrating the history, the fact that this, uh, you know, quite anonymous in certain ways neighborhood uh, birthed Scrabble. Jackson Heights has given us many, many other wonderful things, but Scrabble is one of them. Um, and it's a great story in part because eventually the city, it was quite subtle, so they didn't sort of notice, but eventually the DOT you know, took down um, and, uh, and it was gone. But thankfully, the new councilman there, elected a short time later, Danny Drum, uh, he uh, led the charge to say, this is an important landmark. I want to make it official. And so now you can go to that intersection, that Howard intersection right near where you, you grew up, Suketu, and, uh, and see the sign that's officially the Scrabble Corner. And it has those, those subscript numbers. And of course, one of the things that uh, I'd love to talk about with you when we visit the neighborhood is just the ways in which there's a particular power and poignancy, I think, to uh, this place being the birthplace of this word game because this couple of square miles around the Scrabble Corner, um, as uh, linguists say, you know, are not only the most linguistically diverse uh, part of New York City, um, they're the most linguistically diverse few square miles uh, on the face of the earth. And, even more than that, you know, New York right now estimates, the census only catches a couple hundred languages, but that's because the, the categories are large. Um, better estimates place it above 800 currently spoken in the city. And it seems that uh, as the Endangered Language Alliance tells us, that's not only the most languages spoken in any city on earth now, but most likely the most languages um, that will ever be spoken in one particular place because we're losing languages all the time. So it's a it's an incredible moment, actually, New York City right now, as far as um, the ways in which it is this incredible polyglot um, mix of, of humanity, which is the same mix of, of histories and stories and, and people from the four corners who are here, all making meaning and making place. Well, and as you mentioned in your book, um, the church where travel was first played uh, now holds services in Bahasa, in Mandarin, in Korean, um, sometimes in English, occasionally. So, you know, God is worshipped in many languages in the house that Scrabble built. Um, he, he, he or she is, absolutely. Um, and, you know, you, you ask, like, who has the power to, uh, to name a street? Well, in, in, in these days, it's the city council. 
and you have this incredible statistic that four out of 10 local laws passed by the New York City Council are about renaming. Um, in 2019, they renamed 184 places with honorary names. Um, there are 12,000 intersections in the city, I learned from your book, uh, but they're running out of names. And this reminds me, you know, uh, the city of Bombay, now Mumbai, where I was from before I came to New York, um, went through a similar frenzy of renaming. And the uh, uh, city council of Bombay, the municipal corporation, spent something like 80 to 90% of their time renaming roads. Mm -hmm. But it was quite simple to rename the roads. You just had to bribe a local councillor. Um, and so they ran out of intersections and when they ran out of roads to rename after people wanting to honor their dead relatives, they started renaming intersections. Um, so you could, and then you could name uh, not just an entire block, but half a block. Um, so I'm wondering if as Denny, you know, what the process is in today's New York of renaming and, and some of it has to do with, with political power. Um, uh, there are many cities around the country where uh, you know streets named after Confederate generals are being renamed. Um, so, are there any such things happening in New York City? Yes, absolutely. And this, of course, um, you know, has become a, a vital national conversation. I think about um, for someone who cares about names and the ways in which they can help us to to face our history and to think critically about how our history shapes our present and to you know, hugely exciting and important development, these conversations. Um, what you mentioned about New York, uh, the particularity of New York City in this regard is interesting in part because it is much easier here to add an honorary or second street name to a street. Um, and partly that is down to a, a local law called Local Law 28, which was uh, passed in 1992, which made it much easier for city council uh, to add the second for honorary names, as, as you say. So most of those 180 odd names from a couple of years ago, you know, most of those are just adding a new sign uh, to a street. Um, and those of us who wander the city looking at, looking at signs, you know, I think there's a great pleasure to be taken from this kind of second order geography, which is, you know, city councilors liking to hail prominent local citizens or, or activists or, or people who've, who've, who've died tragic deaths. Um, after 9-11, there was a, a, a large spate of, of adding honorary names for those who, those who died on that day. Uh, but now, you, you know, just in the last uh, couple of years, you have any number of, of musicians and, and other, other figures. You know, there's notorious B.I.G. Way in Brooklyn and Woody Guthrie Way down by, down by Coney Island. And um, Big Pun, another rapper, just got a street up in, up in the Bronx. We have Regis Philbin Way as well. You know, Sesame Street. Finally, as a street, Sesame Street, this mythic, wonderful place we all love, uh, now is a literal place uh, in Manhattan, right, right by Lincoln Center, where where the uh, Children's Television Workshop uh, is, has long been located. Uh, so, in any case, there is that story in New York. Some people think it's too much. I tend to think mostly it's a wonderful thing, um, adding these second names. Uh, there are also many stories in the city uh, that predate 1992 about when the city did do much fewer of these, of these actual name changes, um, when people didn't like them. You know, many of us here, I'm sure, have memories of, uh, well, it's still, it still exists, but Avenue of the Americas, right? In the 40s, Mayor LaGuardia, and essentially in an effort to give Sixth Avenue some kind of cachet to, you know, rival Fifth Avenue, uh, essentially, promulgated this thing where it was going to be called the Avenue of the Americas. There were going to be those new uh, street signs by the, on the lamppost sort of hailing the, the nations of Latin America. But there was a catch, which is many residents and people who did business on Sixth Avenue really had no liking for this new highfalutin name. And finally, in the 80s, the city kind of relented and put the Sixth Avenue signs back up um, and said, so now it's officially got two names. But that that happens often where people, um, you know, want to, uh, they're attached to a name or they like the utility of a name and, and don't like to see it messed with. Um, and so those are, those are fascinating stories too. Um, and I'll tell you just one other story uh, to get to about in this regard um, is that 
there is this great concerted effort now, uh, if not to change names, which in many cases is important and something to be welcomed and, and thought about. And it um, involves people who, who have histories that we both need to confront and also sort of seek to, seek to amend. Um, but there are fascinating examples of, of subtle street name changes that try to honor the memories that people have of a place while also sort of celebrating something new. And one story in that, uh, in that vein from Southern Brooklyn that I love is Corbin Place uh, in Manhattan Beach, uh, which is named for a fellow named Austin Corbin, who was the developer at that time, a sort of Fred Trump figure from, from the 19th century who developed Manhattan Beach and Brighton Beach. And he was uh, a wealthy man who was also a sort of uh, extreme anti-Semite. He belonged to this association for the suppression of Jews. You know, he was, he was a hateful man. And, and people became aware of that history some time ago, of course. And there was a push to change the name of Corbin Place. Um, but the local council person there in, in the community came up with what I think is a, an inspired uh, sort of way to address that history by, they just added a single letter. And so now it's M. Corbin Place. And the official referent there is Margaret Corbin, who was the foremost woman participant in the American Revolutionary War, kind of great local hero of a different kind. Um, so it's this wonderful subtle change where we say we still get to have Corbin place and our memories of it, but now we're celebrating this woman instead of this hateful man. And that's a that is lovely excellent. example, I think. <laughs> that is excellent. Well, I know if it, uh, in certain European cities, you'll have a little explanation on uh, the corner of um, uh, who this dignitary is that this street is named after. Do we have anything like that in New York? Do we have, you know, if you if you want to know who, you know, uh, Mr. Bleeker was, uh, is there any place on Bleeker Street you could find out? Right, well, no, not, you know, it's, it's not really on the streets themselves. There's not much of that. Um, we don't have, you know, our little blue plaques like London does and so on. Um, but there's a, there's a wonderful website that was really vital to, to my writing this book. Um, it's just called oldstreets.com. And it's been a sort of labor of love uh, from a wonderful man named Gilbert Tauber, who's a retired city planner who has devoted much of his retirement and, and years before that to uh, compiling stories of, of streets that are no longer on New York's map from, you know, Paisley Place to uh, neighborhoods like Satan Circus. You know, we still have Hell's Kitchen, but we lost Satan Circus, sadly. Um, and he's also got a wonderful database of honorary names and sort of they weren't compiled in one place until he did that. Um, so that's a great resource. Uh, I would say though that also this goes to your question about name changes that one of the things that I think is so welcome and important right now is, is as much as we can think and talk about name changes and those are important conversations, um, is essentially just adding markers and sort of new statues and new monuments and new names that celebrate histories that haven't been celebrated, whether that's histories of the contributions of women, of people of color, of those who haven't been honored in public space uh, much at all until this century. Um, and a vital example of that is on Wall Street, you know, on Wall Street, where Wall Street crosses Water Street, which used to be the edge of, of Manhattan before it was uh, covered with film. Uh, there's now a marker which shows us where the slave auction block, the main slave auction block in Manhattan was um, in the 16 and 1700s. Uh, people don't think of New York as a slave port, but of course it was. It was vitally imbricated within the slave trade. And, uh, and that's something that we all need to be uh, confronting and thinking about. And I love the ways in which that marker, all of a sudden, you know, you're at this iconic sort of site of American capitalism. You say, oh, Slavery was an important part of American capitalism, and indeed it was. Um, and it's important, as I say, to, to sort of know that. And it's wonderful the ways in which the geography can become visible through markers like that. So um, your book isn't just about names, it's also about numbers. You talk about the uh, grid system of New York and how it you know, makes it much easier to find where you are in Manhattan. But you also talk about one of the most enduring mysteries of my life, which is how 
uh, which genius came up with the idea of a 72nd street and a 72nd court and a 72nd avenue all meeting up in queens all adjacent to each other you go and you find like five different uh, blocks all with the same number so, so so how did that come about yeah you know there's parts of sort of south central queens like in maspeth around there maspeth by the way which means bad water in muncie Lenape language uh, which is around you know new town creek but in any case uh yes there's a place there where you have 72nd street crossing 77th street crossing 63rd it's a wild place uh, no and in any case the story is that queens of course um, was an amalgamation of uh, all these different villages, right? That then sort of becomes amalgamated into one, into one larger entity, one larger polity and county. Um, and it was so difficult though, where the, all those things were sort of crisscrossing and there were efforts to try and sort of regularize them. But because it's not one single grid, we end up with precisely the situation you're talking about. Um, and it's a it's a it's a confounding one for sure. Um, but some of the systems for actual sort of places where you'll get a cluster of street names. I, I love sort of digging into those where, you know, anyone who lives in or been out to Crown Heights, you know, all those streets that are named after towns upstate, for example, you know, Troy, Utica, Albany, across the Buffalo. And what's wonderful about those is they actually evoke a, a, a trip up and across the Erie Canal. And the reason for that is when uh, the old Lefferts farm there was being subdivided into urban space, uh, the surveyor decided to kind of honor the, the recently opened Erie Canal. And so we've put those things in order to kind of evoke that, that trip. Um, and there are all kinds of examples like that. The electric streets in the Bronx, Ohm and Ampere and Watt, the developer was an electricity magnate, put those there. But, uh, Anyway, there's so many of those, the sort of little systems, which aren't necessarily a grid, but uh, do speak in these fantastic evocative ways of, of history or other geographies or, or stories. So names, as you point out, are about uh, power. Uh, the act of naming is uh, about power. And it's also uh, about gender. Uh, so in that wonderful book that you put together with uh, Rebecca Solnit and Garnet Cadogan, uh, uh, Rebecca came out with this, uh, a reimagined map of the New York City subway, where if instead of all these male names, which predominate, if each of the subway stops were to be named after a woman who lived in that vicinity. And it was really eye-opening. I remember when it came out in the New Yorker, lots of people were really, you know, it, it made them look at the city with um, it, 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 fresh eyes. Um, so uh, I'm wondering if, if you had your druthers, if there are like five places in the in the city that that you would rename, and if so, what what would they be? What a great question! Um, and I should say first that yes, the city of women that was one of my favorites from the, the Nonstop Metropolis project, and it was a joy to to research it and sort of do the digging and say, okay, who came from this place? Cindy Lopper from Ozone Park. Or, you know, we named the, the stops out by the US Open for the Williams sisters. And one of the things that was wonderful about how that map was received was just to hear people talk about, wow, I would see my city so differently if it sort of honored my gender or different kinds of people um, in different ways. So yes, in that spirit, let's see, what would I, well, you know, one type of name that I would love to, if I had the power to just see banned forevermore. There's this such a, 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 a trend now for, you know, these acronym uh, kind of cutesy real estate names, which is to say, you know, began with Soho and Tribeca and fair enough, those were kind of community led artists came up with those, those cute tags, the triangle beneath Canal Street, south of Houston. But then right away, you know, I was picked up uh, by real estate agents and used to kind of sell those neighborhoods as commodities, right? And now we have, you know, Nolita and Dumbo and, and Nomad and, uh, you know, Bokaka, which is terrible. You know, Borum Hill, it's Borum Hill, Carroll Gardens, uh, Cobble Hill, sort of an evocation of Brownstone, Brooklyn. And the worst, you know, thank God it hasn't caught on, but there was an effort a couple of years ago to to rebrand re the South Bronx Sobro. Uh, so let it never happen, let's hope. Uh, so anyway, we can get 
get rid of those would be great. Um, uh, let's see another a neighborhood that I adore. And so I don't advocate for changing its name, but uh, just, just for the fun of it. Um, Astoria, wonderful part of Queens. Astoria though, the sort of story of its name is, is kind of um, kind of a bummer in the sense that the people who founded Astoria, uh, you know, essentially named it for John Jacob Astor, the illustrious uh, trader in furs and then real estate magnate whose, whose mansion they could see across the East River, essentially because they hoped he would send them money. Uh, he sent $500, never set foot in the place. Um, and so Astoria, it's a sort of sad way is named for this man who couldn't care less about it. But as with many places, the story has its own significance now. So we should leave that one be. Um, let's see, I mentioned, if I could bring a neighborhood name back, Satan Circus, I think is wonderful, the aforementioned. Uh, and then some, you know, there are new names. Maybe I'll just uh, conclude with this one. That the, uh, you know, where the where the city tries to sort of add a new tag, an honorific tag to a place. I mentioned Avenue of the Americas, but you know, for example, the Triborough Bridge is now officially the RFK Bridge, right? But and Robert F. Kennedy, an admirable man, uh, no problem with naming something after him. But it's this funny thing where. How can you tell a new arrival or a tourist to the city, right? If they're asking you where the RFK bridge is, to New Yorkers, the Triborough is the Triborough, right? Um, and so I think that sometimes there's there's names again that get fiddled with too much, and and those who sort of have an investment in the place and the city uh, would just assume leave the Triborough, the Triborough. So there's a few of those anyway. Yeah, John Jacob after this. Um... In the great Melville story, Bartleby the Scrivener, he talks about the, the lawyer who loves saying the aloud the name John Jacob Astor, and he says it it has a sound like unto bullion that it it, it sounds like money. Uh, Astor plays, um, which reminds me, by the way, just of, of, of sound. You know how many how many street names? And I know we're about to get into Q and A, but um, how many neighborhood names too are just about the sound? You know, Arvern. In Southern Queens is one that I love, Arvern and Arvern by the Sea. Um, name comes from the developer it was Remington Vernon and his wife evidently liked the way that he signed his checks, which was R. Vernon. Uh, and so she said, you know, you should name this, name this neighborhood Arvern. It has a nice ring to it. Um, and so Arvern is still with us. That's wonderful. Uh, we have some time uh, for some questions, so I'll just um, uh, read out some of the, uh, uh, the uh, questions. There's, um, uh, there's one that says, can you talk about how some names in other languages when translated into English acquire mm -hmm. new meanings and how that has changed the understanding of the place? I'm thinking of names like Dutch Kills or Hell's Kitchen, but maybe there are other examples from uh, different languages? What a good, yeah, great question. Um, yes, no, the kills is a, is, a, is a sort of classic and fascinating example. You know, I remember even as a kid, uh, you know, driving past the exit for fresh kills and going, what is that? That sounds so macabre, you know, and it's this, it's this funny way where I think that that word in part because it meant something in English stuck around. But another example of that is, you know, the Hellgate, the Hellgate Bridge. Um, it meant something in Dutch. It was the, uh, off the top of my head, I'm not recalling exactly what, but it was the old gat or some such. And the English sort of took that Dutch word and made it the Hellgate because there were these nasty rocks there and there were, there were many sort of shipwrecks. So it's this interesting way in which the sound actually becomes um, evocative of something in a new language and, and thus a new place name. Uh, but in, in contemporary times, I'll give you another uh, example of this sort of speaks to immigrant placemaking. Um, you know, uh, 8th Avenue in Southern Brooklyn, right, which is the center of kind of Brooklyn Chinatown now, um, is now the name in Chinese for the whole larger enclave. And, and part of why that is, is because the number eight carries a significance. It means good fortune and good luck um, uh, to many of those immigrants from China who live there. So it's this wonderful way in which a name in English becomes evocative of something else in another uh, sort of language and, and, and culture. And, and there are so many examples of that. 
uh, there's a question about uh, process. Which is, um, I'd love to hear about how you research the material you cover in this book when there is simply so much to explore. Like, where did you even start your research with a topic like this? Like, of all those names, you know, yeah. how did you pick the, the, the stories you wanted to explore? Yeah, it, well, absolutely. I mean, one of the, I will say that one of the wonderful things about living in the city is, um, you know, and something I feel really fortunate about is that New York has had no shortage of people who are obsessed with this place, who love this place, who love its history. There's a vast and wonderful bibliography of New York. Um, and so much of the work in this book, you know, borrowing and, and sort of building on the, the research of, of the borough of historical societies, of, of many of the great historians have written about New York. Um, our friend Gilbert Tauber, who I mentioned, oldstreets.com. Uh, so a lot of my work was just sort of reading this stuff and absorbing it. And then in this book, you know, which is not a vast, it's not the six volume iconography of Manhattan Island that you heard about at the top. You know, it's a sort of slim book that's meant to be an essay about not just the sort of ways in which these names came to be, but, but exploring them and how they shape our sense of place. So, you know, it tries to synthesize a lot of research of others, but I'm a, I, I don't claim to have uh, so many incredible scoops. I've got a few in there. Um, but it's, it's trying to sort of synthesize these things in a way that, that makes them stories, you know, because as I say, place names are stories. Okay. Um, another question is, I'd love to hear about how you research. Oh, sorry, I uh, did this. Um, a lot of names in New York and the US come from Europe. Are mm. there names in New York that have inspired names of places in Europe and other places around the world? So this is a good question because I noticed the, the word Brooklyn, which was not sexy when in the 1970s when I first came here. Now, if you, you can find a Brooklyn cafe in Sao Paulo and Mumbai and Lagos. This. Yeah, yes. <laughs> um, yeah. No, Brooklyn, Brooklyn's a great example that it has become, it's gained this cachet in New York itself, I think, to a certain extent, that's true. Um, but you know, one, one in particular that I've loved researching and learning about, um, Perhaps the most uh, honored, toponymically honored person, uh, to my knowledge, there's, there's probably others and imaginary people and so on. George Washington is an incredibly uh, sort of popular figure as far as place names go. And not just obviously in the US, we have states and towns and streets and mountains, but all around the world, you know, there's a, there's a Washington uh, Boulevard in, in Poland and Italy and in Santo Domingo, the Dominican Republic, the sort of seafront uh, boulevard is, is Avenida George Washington. And of course he's admired as the, as the sort of so-called father of, of, uh, of the first you know, constitutional democracy in world history as, 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 as people like to view him. So there's a way in which uh, his name is spread all over the place. But yeah, in current times, Brooklyn, Brooklyn's got to take the cake. <laughs> um. A uh, question to ask, can you talk a bit more about the books you recommended? What is it about them that stands out? Great question. Well, I think first and foremost, I mentioned uh, Suketu's recent book, uh, This Land is Our Land, An Immigrant's Manifesto. And I think it, um, not to embarrass our interlocutor here, but it is really the vital source for me on the ways in which uh, immigration is not the threat to American society and politics, but it's really our, our salvation economically and culturally and otherwise, and uh, beautifully written, beautifully researched, read it. Um, let's see, Luc Saint, Low Life, uh, fabulous classic look at uh, lower Manhattan uh, of a century or so ago, uh, the wonderful kind of anarchic life of, of New York before it was an orderly place as if it ever really became an orderly place, but when it was really extra chaotic and wonderful and, uh, you know, Satan Circus was a thing and Corlear's Hook was a thing and, and uh, the Lower East Side was, was a different Lower East Side. Um, anyway, marvelous book. Uh, what else did I put? Oh, The Atlas, Nonstop Metropolis is the work of, of mine and several cherished collaborators, maps of the city of languages and fires and, and uh, basketball courts in Brooklyn and many other things. Um, Oh, and finally, the, the Stokes work, that sort of insane six-volume iconography of Manhattan Island. Um, if you really want to dig deep into 
bygone places and, and statues and streets of, of Manhattan. That's a, a wonderful kind of antiquated but but marvelous source uh, that you will enjoy if you dig this sort of stuff. Uh, besides Manhattan and Canarsie, are there uh, any key examples of place names that come from the tribes that were here first? Thank you for asking that. I, um, I was conscious of not talking much about indigenous languages. So that's a great, great query. Um, yes, there are many. Uh, uh, you can go Rockaway, uh, Gowanus was the name of, a, of an Ape leader in that part, Maspeth I mentioned. Um, over in New Jersey, there are countless ones, Hoboken and Hackensack and Passaic and, and Raritan and Hohokus and up in Westchester, you have Armonk and you have, you know, Tappan Z is in fact a, a mix of Dutch and Munsi, which is the language the Lenape spoke. The Tappan were, uh, were a group, a, a band of Lenape up there in what's now Westchester. And Z is the old Dutch word for sea. So where the Hudson gets all wide there, right? They called it the Tappan Z and there it is. Um, and I should say that one of the real most pleasurable experiences in working on this book was uh, I had the opportunity to take a, a Lenape uh, language class, um, thanks to the Endangered Language Alliance, their offices by Union Square. Um, a woman uh, who belongs to the tribe, uh, most of the descendants of the Lenape now live either in Ontario or in Oklahoma uh, on reservations in those places or nearby. Um, but this wonderful woman, Karen Hunter, drives down to teach these classes. and. Um, no, it was a very powerful experience really to hear her and her students sort of speaking the Muncie language that was spoken here when Europeans arrived. So there's a rich history there of, of indigenous place names and, um, and much more to dig into, absolutely. Uh, a very specific question. Why does Fourth Avenue get skipped on uh, the, uh, the Upper East Side and replaced with a tree named avenues. So Fourth Avenue, I guess it ends in what, 14th Street. Uh, if, yeah, and then, so, and, and so yeah. What happened to Fourth Avenue? <laughs> Excellent question. Uh, the specific anecdote I don't have on the top of my head right now, the sort of moment of the grid being uh, sort of laid over Manhattan and then, and then built up. Uh, there are all kinds of sort of little negotiations that happened there where certain name streets got, got names. Uh, Lexington Avenue, for example, is a, is, a, is a great and interesting one. Park Avenue, we sort of know the, the reference there. Um, but Lexington Avenue is kind of great because it just, uh, it celebrates the American Revolutionary War and precisely the place where the first shots were fired in Massachusetts, right? Um, and so we have Lexington, Kentucky, other Lexingtons, but it was a sort of nothing name, uh, but that in the early 19th century um, in the newly born United States, right, meant a lot. So thus we have Lexington Avenue. You know, uh, um, I'm wondering what happened to naming in, in the age of Google Maps. Uh, mm -hmm. You point out in your book that uh, taxi drivers in New York don't need to pass the knowledge like they do in London, where they have to undergo this incredibly arduous multi-year process of having to learn every single damn street name in the city of London. Uh, you don't need to do that in, in the grid, but it, you know, it used to be, you'd go for a drive somewhere and you'd get these maps or you'd get maps from AAA and, uh, or you'd just have to roll down your window and ask someone on the street where something was and now it's all there on your, your device. Um, so, so how how that how's technology changed the process of finding our way in cities? Do we still need to know these names? Yeah, it's a great question. And one of the things, one anecdote that I sort of loved finding out for the book was that, you know, place making. I like to talk about how new arrivals to a place sort of make those places home and whether they get an honorary street name that, you know, hails Little Haiti and Flatbush now. Or, Lois Saida in the Puerto Rican Lower East Side, right? Um, but now one of the ways that people do that is literally through petitioning Google Maps. You know, Google Maps, one of the ways that we all kind of uh, refer to and get around you know, in a marvelous technology, but also to me, something's lost from paper maps, which give us context and perhaps give us a deeper sense of story. 
But of course, technology, we live with it. It, it helps us get around. Um, but there's a story, for example, in the Bronx, of uh, in a part of the Bronx, sort of central, not far from the zoo and, and the botanical garden, which is the home to Regis Philbin Way, which is where Regis uh, RIP grew up. Uh, he has an honorary street there. But now that particular area is a sort of mini uh, Yemeni enclave. Um, people from, from Yemen have settled there, um, not a huge amount, but they have a, a, a sort of vibrant community. And this man who works as an air traffic controller at, at JFK, it became his, his passion to see little Yemen recognized. And I think he didn't get that far, at least initially with the city or his local, local council person, but he petitioned Google and he got Google now. If you if you look it up, if you look up Little Yemen, you will find on your on your Google map uh, Little Yemen there in North Central uh, Bronx. Um, and so there's this great way it's labeled. Um, and so place making I think happens in all kinds of ways now. Um, and to me, there's something irreplaceable about paper maps. I think that paper maps do something that um, technology, which is sometimes passive, you know, tells us turn left, turn right but it doesn't give us a sense of broader context or layers of the place. Um, though it, it could and can, um, I hope that it does more of that. Um, in any case, I love paper maps, but obviously uh, technology is with us and it's, it's doing some marvelous things and some less marvelous things. And sometimes it's good not to have a map at all because if you never get lost, you'll never find anything new. Um, Precisely. We no, so kids, we have our a friend Garnet Cadigan is a wonderful essayist about walking. And one of the things he talks about is that in walking, one thing you do is open yourself to, to serendipity and to encounter and, and to experiencing all the worlds that this this city contains. And um, and of course the, the sort of passion for those worlds and the ways in which they rub against each other and sometimes difficult but often magical ways is you know, that's one of the things I care about in terms of writing about this city and exploring it. And um, yeah, so here's the getting lost too, and exploring new new streets and encounters. Uh, uh, I could con continue this conversation all night, but we have to end here. So um, thank you everyone in the audience for uh, joining us. Thank you, Josh, for writing this wonderful book. And I really just urge all of you to just get this book and to go out in a great city, you know, with it, and, and whether you're on a street that's in the book or not, it'll really make you think about all the, you know, the layers of story. Uh, I teach a course called Storied New York uh, uh, at NYU, uh, and I most certainly will be um, assigning this to my students in the fall. But it's just such a wonderful guide, and you, Josh, are such a wonderful raconteur. Um, and uh, I hope to go for a walk with you very soon around the streets of Nueva York. Here's so, to that. Here's to Nueva York. And here's to all of us getting back out in public soon. That would be a joyous thing. So thank you to you, Suketu. Thank you to the library. Always a, a thrill and an honor. And, and here's to our great city. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you for joining us tonight. On screen, we are showing closing slides. This slide contains an image of the featured book jacket. The cover shows a view of the waterfront of Lower Manhattan looking uptown with two bridges and neighboring boroughs visible in the background. The depiction of Manhattan dates to a time when the skyline was very different with a few tall buildings, but before the proliferation of skyscrapers. The text reads, Names of New York, Discovering the city's past, present, and future through its place names. Joshua Jelly Shapiro. Names of New York is available for purchase online from the library shop, on.nypl.org slash shop live. Proceeds benefit the New York Public Library. Reserve a copy for free with a New York Public Library card. Visit tonight's event page to find this title in a variety of formats, nypl.org slash live. The last slide shows live from NYPL upcoming events. Thursday, April 29th, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. A Thousand Years of Persian Poetry by Women. Readings, Music, and Conversation. Tuesday, May 4th, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. The Mysteries. 
Marissa Silver with Jennifer Egan, co-presented with the Dorothy and Lewis B. Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers. For more information and to register, visit nypl.org live.